so happy to be here and we're really pleased to be able to share our work and our thoughts uh, in this case about systemic uh, healing and psychedelic medicine. Systemic referring to something that's spread throughout affecting a group or a system such as a body, economy, market, society as a whole, a family, a group. We'll re review the current status of this in psychedelic medicine and our clinical experiences related to how to apply this in family systems, communities, and groups. And we'll go over relevant theory recommendations to support the movement to e an even broader focus on systems in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, especially with regard to addressing complex and challenging issues uh, that need our attention in the world today. So over the past several years, we've witnessed a renaissance of sorts uh, with a growing body of evidence suggesting that a number of psychedelic compounds hold very strong therapeutic potential to catalyze and accelerate the healing process for a wide range of mental health conditions, ranging from PTSD to treatment resistant major depressive disorder, addictions, eating disorders, and, uh, and more. So not only are these studies showing effectiveness, but also sustained effectiveness. MAPS, of course, is conducting now phase three trials of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for treatment-resistant PTSD under the FDA's breakthrough therapy designation. And the results, to be honest, are quite striking. Um, an analysis of phase two data showed that at 12-month follow-up, 67% uh, of individuals no longer met diagnostic criteria for PTSD. And to give another example, uh, this study by Robin and colleagues at Imperial published in the Lancet Psychiatry found that uh, depressive symptoms were reduced rapidly and sustained over time in patients with treatment resistant depression who received just two doses of psilocybin uh, plus psychotherapy. And as a psychiatrist, uh, I just want to point out the two doses of a medicine plus psychotherapy resulting in this type of not only change, but sustained change is incredibly exciting to me. Um, and a lot of research has been conducted and data continues to come out showing that as a whole, these medicines are not only safe, but well tolerated by the majority of participants. And though more research, of course, is needed to better understand safety, especially in the context of uh, high risk conditions, these favorable safety profiles are, are letting us uh, explore deeper these medicines and ways of delivering the medicine. So we're now able to move from an understanding of the potential of these medicines more broadly toward a delineation of what works best for whom and in what context, whether it's research, clinics, or retreats. And so we've come to understand that there's an order in which things need to occur for the, the advancement of psychedelic medicine. First, at an individual le level, like the studies we've just illustrated, for example. And thanks to this work, we can become even more creative uh, with the way we approach psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, including an increased focus on systemic factors. Uh, and uh, by doing so, uh, it's our hope that we'll see put, uh, cost effectiveness uh, or even more accessibility for some. Group work uh, offers unique healing opportunities, even, even perhaps uh, the potential for improved outcomes. And the more people come together, for healing purposes as groups, the more there's the potential for ripple effects uh, into family systems, communities, and beyond. Thanks, Reed. And so um, today, yeah, we'll talk about families, we'll talk about groups and communities, and even further out. And so I'm really excited to talk to you about the family work because um, this is an area that I've been dedicating a significant portion of my career for over a, a decade. and working with families has been um, just uh, really exciting for me, but also um, very important because um, when individuals present with suffering, sometimes they're simply the canary in the coal mine and they are reflecting a broader system in need of care. 
And also when we involve, when we involve family members, um, there are some unique benefits that we can expect both at the individual level and also at the family level. So let's take a look at that. Thank you. So some of the benefits of family involvement, um, well, there are several, but first let me speak about one of them. If uh, I feel like I'm a pretty good psychotherapist, I've been at this for a long time, but if on my best day of psychotherapy, I work with a patient, um, I'm going to be able to help them. Psychotherapy research shows that what we do is effective for many, but if I teach a family member or a support person or a loved one in that patient's life, how to use some of the skills that I use and they use them with their loved one, they're actually going to have more of an impact because of the neurobiological bond that exists between loved ones. And so the neuroscience supports the healing power of supportive caregiver loved one interactions. So the more we can recruit family members or loved ones in terms of allies in care, the more effective the treatment is likely to be. The other piece is mental health issues often require um, a lot more intervention than what can be offered in the context of conventional healthcare. And so when we recruit families, especially if we teach them skills or we offer them a supportive role, then we can actually create a bridge from the clinic to the home setting where more support can be offered and it can be done live in vivo as it's happening, which research shows is actually um, increases effectiveness. The other piece about family healing and family-based work is that when there's someone in the family who's suffering from a chronic health or mental health condition, everyone in the system is affected. And so caregivers have the right to support, um, especially since having someone in the family who's suffering makes it so that they themselves start experiencing either mental health symptoms or polarizations and patterns of relating to one another. In fact, there are some places in the world where if, if someone in the family is suffering from a serious mental health issue, then caregivers in that unit actually have the right to support and that's protected um, legally. And then finally, when we involve families in healing work, we have the potential to interrupt intergenerational patterns of pain. And um, I've had the opportunity of working with a child and their parent and their grandparent across the lifespan. And a little bit can go a really long way. In fact, if we look at the next slide, when we look at caregiver focused interventions, so interventions where we recruit loved ones, family members, whatever the definition is for you, and we teach them specific skills to support the individual who's suffering, either from depression or an eating disorder or an anxiety disorder. When we look at outcomes for both the individual who's suffering and their family members, we find that there are benefits for all. So there's reduced psychopathology in the person suffering, better quality of life, not just for the person suffering, but for their family members too, reduced lengths of stay and higher engagement in, in uh, service, less stress or conflict in the family, and reduced caregiver burden, which I feel is really, really important. In fact, we um, recently learned um, from our colleagues who work in the chronic health field that caregiver burden is less related to active time uh, spent caregiving and more related to feeling like your efforts aren't worthwhile. And so in some of the models that we're going to present, we'll show you how we are supporting family members in really specific and strategic ways to help their loved one so that everyone feels better. Um, about a decade ago, I co-developed a treatment model called emotion-focused family therapy. And it's one of those interventions where members are, are recruited and supported to become allies in care. And so influenced by that model and others, uh, Reed and I have been applying these principles to the research and practice of psychedelic medicine. So um, there's this tripartite model of family-based psychedelic healing, and this is still very much in development, but we're excited to share with you our ideas. So there are three models. The first is family-supported psychedelic medicine. 
And that involves the recruitment of family members, caregivers who learn those specific skills to support their loved one throughout the course of a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, making it so that the home environment is far more recovery focused, leveraging the neurobiological bond that exists between them. The second model is family-based psychedelic medicine, and that involves the recruitment of family members, one or more, who participate in medicine um, sessions together. So along with their loved one who might have um, a diagnosis of a mental health issue. And so again, we're leveraging that neurobiological bond, but we're also bringing healing to the system in case that there might be um, maintenance patterns in that system in terms of the symptoms of, um, of attention. And then the third model involves surrogate psychedelic medicine. And um, this one is, we find very fascinating where family members participate in psychedelic psychotherapy on behalf of their loved one. And this would be in situations where, for example, the person who's struggling with a mental health issue isn't able, willing, or isn't ready to participate in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. They might be on an SSRI, for example. And so we'll uh, give an illustration of a case study in a little bit. So the first model is family supported psychedelic medicine. And so remember that's the model where we recruit caregivers and we teach them skills so that they can actually be treatment allies throughout the course of the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Here are a few examples that we're involved with. So Reed and I are involved in a number of studies and the first is an MDMA assisted psychotherapy study for eating disorders sponsored by MAPS. And in the context of this study, every participant we recruit will also identify a support person, whether it's a spouse or partner or an adult family member um, or another close person in their life who's already involved in providing some kind of support. And that individual is going to be um, present for at least one of the prep sessions, some of the integration sessions, and they'll be offered some skills training throughout the protocol so that they can support their loved one um, with their emotions, but even with um, meal support, you know, if needed throughout the treatment. We're gonna be doing something really similar um, with the group in Imperial College in London. So we're just having these meetings right now to establish the um, nature of the support person's involvement. And then finally, um, Reed and I just finished uh, two pretty important studies looking at emotion-focused ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, both for major depressive disorder and um, for anorexia nervosa. So we'll talk a little bit more about that one, especially since it's so fresh. So emotion-focused ketamine-assisted psychotherapy is a treatment model that we've been developing over the last year. And it's, it's a ketamine-assisted psychotherapy model that is heavily influenced by EFT, emotion-focused therapy, and therefore it's a recognized psychotherapeutic theory, which includes recognized and evidence-based psychotherapeutic techniques to facilitate healing and growth in um, our patients. And so what's unique about FCAP, as we call it, is that um, it's very guided by theoretical principles that are um, evidence-based. And the first principle is that we believe that one of the core um, features of most emotion-based disorders is a difficulty with emotion processing. And that can make it so that people are, are more at risk of either developing symptoms or engaging in symptoms. Therefore, if we can focus our efforts on increasing our patient's skill and confidence with emotion processing, then their need for symptoms will naturally decrease. And so every aspect of the FCAP model from the prep session to the ketamine sessions, to the psychotherapeutic integration sessions, to the closing sessions, every step of the way, we're focusing on being really deliberate about supporting our patients to increase their skill and confidence with emotion processing. We also leverage the healing power of families by providing um, a support person 
or a family member education and skills so that we can strengthen one of the, their most meaningful relationships, create that recovery friendly environment outside of the therapy office, including that bridge, and then even extending healing beyond the individual. And we'll show you a video um, about that in a little bit. So here's an example of our protocol. It's a 15 day protocol. And so it's, it's very brief, but it's also very intensive. And um, it starts off with a prep session. It's an overall prep session where we describe um, for the participant and their family member what we're gonna do and why every step of the way, including teaching them all the theory about emotion processing and mental health issues. And that's followed by three dosing step sessions, which are spaced out by a few days. And after each dosing session, within the 24 hour period, there is a psychotherapeutic integration um, session. And that's because ketamine has this really unique property of creating favorable brain-based conditions for the, for the psychotherapy to actually be even more impactful. And each psychotherapy session is um, the content is um, derived or influenced by emotion theory. So we start with self-interruption around emotion, then we look at healthy anger, and then we finish with self-compassion. And that's very much in line with um, research that has shown that um, doing it this way can actually be most helpful to support clients to increase their skill and confidence with emotion processing. At the same time, a family member or that support person attends the prep session. They watch a video on advanced emotional support strategies informed by EFFT. They participate in two coaching sessions with an EFFT therapist to learn these um, emotion coaching skills. And they have opportunities to practice the strategy with high impact scenarios. So for example, um, in, our, in our study that we just conducted with anorexia nervosa, the project partner or the family member learned how to respond in ways that were positive and productive to statements like, I feel fat, I don't want to eat that, I don't want to recover. And those are statements that you know family members struggle with so much. And so when they feel equipped with what to say and what to say is actually more likely to have a positive effect, everyone feels better. They're also invited to participate in dosing sessions two and three, uh, so long as the participant feels comfortable with that. And then they uh, attend the closing session too. And so, as you can see, they're a very integral part of the whole process. Um, though we spend much more time with the individual with the diagnosis who we're treating, the project partner or the family member is still um, a significant uh, focus you know, throughout. The great thing about the protocol that we're working on is that um, while it's brief and uh, it's high impact, high intensity, which means that um, we're really hoping that it'll be applied in a number of different contexts. So first for prevention, uh, second uh, for at-risk populations. It can also be used as an intensive intervention, you know, when, you, when someone needs a boost um, or as relapse prevention. And that's particularly relevant in, for disorders that um, tend to be more treatment resistant. Uh, so we're really excited about that. So we're gonna show you a clip um, from our case study of FCAP for depression. And so you're gonna see, uh, you'll see a video of a woman who, um, when we met her, uh, she met criteria for severe major depressive disorder. She was mom of two kids. Um, unemployed. Uh, she was in the middle of a prolonged and uh, treatment resistant depressive episode. She also had medical comorbidities, um, serious Crohn's that led to a resection of her bowel just a couple months before we um, met with her. And uh, she and her husband were in the middle of a separation. So she actually participated in the study protocol with her husband. Um, they had a very positive relationship and they were very close, especially with their co-parenting. And so he, um, he joined us in the ways that we described previously. And at the end of our two-week study protocol, she scored in the mild range for depression. 
at two months follow-up, she was in remission and asymptomatic and actually just reported that she started working. Um, and so that's really exciting. So Reed and I are, are working on the results uh, for publication so that we can get that out there. And so we're gonna show you a little video about um, her, but also her partner's experience. And so actually we're gonna focus more on her partner's experience, the family piece. And so just note a couple of things uh, one is she speaks about her experience. Two is that he talks about how being involved and being supported and being taught skills helped him not just to support her, but in um, a number of different ways in his life. And he even talks about using the skills with his daughter. His daughter's name is Riot. So you'll hear him refer to that. And then finally, um, his, uh, his wife makes a comment about how she wishes he could have uh, actually done the ketamine protocol, but he's really clear in saying like, no, 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 I was really good doing what I was doing, um, just showcasing how important, how the systemic healing can be even positive for people depending on where they're at in terms of readiness to um, participate in psychedelic assisted psychotherapies. So the second model from that tripartite model that Adele talked about involves the recruitment of caregivers who participate in medicine sessions alongside their loved one uh, in order to leverage that neurobiological bond and deepen the process of healing and growth. Um, and it may even uh, attend to problematic relation, relational patterns that might be keeping one stuck or helping to uh, heal old wounds um, in, in family systems. So, for example, we recently delivered a family-based ketamine-assisted psychotherapy treatment uh, in clinic out here in Utah using this model number two, where all family members participate in medicine sessions with the goal of uh, healing and growth for the, the entire family unit. And so this, it was an incredibly rewarding process to participate in and was so touching to see caregivers not only supporting their loved one, Th through the course of treatment, but also bravely st stepping up and participating right there alongside them doing the work hand in hand. And, and I've got to say it, it added a level of connection in the family system that I've never seen before in treatment. And uh, we hope uh, this work might reduce the likelihood of problematic uh, patterns continuing that can be obstacles and interfere with uh, treatment goals and, and successful outcomes on the path forward. So as, as Yaron mentioned, we also work with Ayahuasca internationally and are in the planning phases of a therapeutic family-based retreat using this uh, medicine and this model as well. So the last model that we'll talk about is the surrogate psychedelic, psychedelic medicine model. And um, this, it, recall, is when family members participate in psychedelic-assisted um, psychotherapy or psychedelic medicine protocols on behalf of their loved one um, who, for different reasons, can't participate um, for themselves. And so I'll just present to you a case example And so this is a um, this is a real case, and that um, I'd been involved with in different ways in terms of supporting the family in the context of conventional treatment. And so um, Henna's daughter Maya suffered from a very serious eating disorder. Um, Maya was um, 18 years old. They participated in several specialized eating disorder treatment programs at different levels of care. And it just wasn't working for their family and they were feeling really um, scared and uh, hopeless. And so um, Hena, the mom, heard about the plant medicine ayahuasca and she really, really wanted her daughter to attend an ayahuasca retreat. She wanted her to get a break from the eating disorder. She was hopeful that maybe it could lead to some lasting change. And I'd done research in that area, so knew it was possible, but also knew that um, there are some real risks to going to an uh, out of country retreat when you have an eating disorder and you're a young woman. Um, either way, unfortunately, um, Maya wasn't able to attend the retreat because she, her medical status was such that they wouldn't accept her. She wasn't stable enough medically. 
So mom decided to go to the retreat on her daughter's behalf. And she kind of referred to herself as a surrogate healer, which meant that for every ceremony that she um, experienced, she led, she went in with the intention on show me how to best support my daughter. And wow, hearing about it, it was so, so incredible. Um, the ceremonies helped her to understand her daughter's experience of the eating disorder in a way that she'd never understood, which meant that she could then validate her daughter in a deeper way than ever before. She also saw that she was inadvertently engaging in problematic patterns that were unfortunately maintaining some of the symptoms. And she saw it in a way that she wasn't blaming herself or feeling terrible. It was like this awakening, like, oh my gosh, when I do this, it actually isn't so helpful. And she saw also what would be optimal, you know, in terms of um, support strategies for her daughter. So she went home a completely different person in terms of like her hope and her optimism, but also her clarity regarding what to do, what not to do. And the other piece was because she attended a retreat outside um, abroad, you know, she had a week of also, of also taking care of herself, which after you've been the caregiver to someone with a severe and chronic eating disorder for a very long time, of course, you know, it's going to affect you as well in terms of your fatigue and your stress levels. And so um, it was a really positive experience, not to say everyone's experiences would be like this, but it, it really got us thinking really seriously about surrogate healing, especially when people uh, who are suffering need healing, but are medically unstable or are on psychiatric medications that make it impossible for them to receive this kind of, um, this kind of medicine. All right, so next let's talk about groups. So, I mean, if you, if you can't tell from the way we're talking about the family piece, like we just think it's so, so exciting. And yes, people need some specialized training in working with families because it, it does require um, a slightly different skill set than individual work. Um, but we really do believe that it's a really worthwhile advice investment. And so I would say the same thing is uh, true for groups as well. Uh, working with groups is also another system that we can look at um, to help promote healing for the individual and for the systems in which they find themselves. Um, but also, we also you know, need to look at some additional training in order to be able to manage all the different dynamics, especially if you throw psychedelics in the mix. So let's just look first at leveraging the healing power of groups. So when we look at um, the individual level, Research and practice over decades has shown that groups offer unique um, healing opportunities. So research has shown that group-based work, not medicine work, just, just group-based psychotherapy um, can reduce the experience of internalized stigma and shame around experiencing mental health issues. It can increase treatment engagement and also uh, decrease dropout. So those are all really, really powerful um, outcomes. The other amazing benefit of groups that has been noted over the years by our, our group psychotherapy colleagues is that um, people learn how to um, be with people in groups, especially people with whom they have differences. And so when we're in the context of group psychotherapy, the ex there is a certain expectation that one is going to show up with some vulnerability, right? We're working um, on a shared goal in terms of improving our mental health. And so when we connect in vulnerability like that, and we have a shared goal, strong bonds um, are formed. And those bonds can actually help people to um, see each other in a new light even if there are cultural, um, political differences that may have otherwise um, created um, conflict between them. So group therapy is an opportunity for people to learn how to coexist and co-construct, and they learn how to respond to each other in really respectful ways, problem solve, um, disagree with each other, uh, as well as um, having more opportunities to experience what it's like for the other. 
So when you combine those potential treatment ingredients, both at the individual level and at the group level with psychedelics, then, um, you know, we really think that there's some important opportunities for even broader change. So when I uh, conducted a pilot study of group-based ketamine-assisted psychotherapy at an eating disorder treatment center out here in Utah, Center for Change, a couple of years ago, it was actually easier than I thought it would be to integrate uh, into conventional treatment programming. And it was also very well received by participants. Uh, in fact, I was so touched by the follow-up surveys we just did and the comments uh, shared by the participants looking back on that uh, even now. Um, and it was also professionally and personally meaningful to me. I learned a lot about both the power of the group format, like Adele was saying, and, but also how to do things better. Uh, we're working on writing up the manuscript for publication, but as a spoiler, I'll just say that we saw improvements in both depression and anxiety in individuals with serious eating disorders who were at a high level of care. And we've also done a pilot uh, project of group base cap in clinic for PTSD and clinically, uh, in addition to groups for psychotherapeutic integration, we're working on the logistics of how to roll out this as an option for clients. One thing just to say about um, the group work is that, um, you know, our colleagues from the group psychotherapy field have spent literally decades answering the question, which is better, individual or group? And the consensus is that um, some people do better in individuals, some people do better in groups, some people need both. And so we still need to kind of do that work in the context of psychedelic medicine. Um, but again, we do feel like it's very worthwhile and we can now start to kind of even extend these concepts um, further, even broader still, you know? So um, we touched on, I touched on it a little bit in that slide previously, when we talked about people in groups can learn to co-create and co-construct together. And there are some people in the space who have been doing some amazing work looking at some of those processes at, um, to bring healing to gender, political, racial, and even cultural divides. And so I just wanna speak a little bit about the work of uh, Lior, Natalie, and Antoine, who did qualitative research among Israelis and Palestinians who drank ayahuasca together. And I had the opportunity to speak to uh, uh, two of the individuals who participated in this research and hearing the passion, you know, uh, in terms of their experiences, witnessing this healing unfold was really amazing. They, they described that um, individuals who participated in these ceremonies had experiences moving beyond political and cultural identities. So there was like a deconstruction of identity of self or as um, being a part of a particular political group or cultural group in support of connections that were more humanistic. So part of a global family, for example. And they even shared that um, when members of the different groups would engage in prayer or in song, that it would lead to really beautiful experiences for the other group. Um, again, bringing healing to, um, to some of these divides in a really beautiful way. And, and just to note that these ceremonies weren't intentionally created to heal cultural or, or political divides. Um, that wasn't the, out, the um, objective, but it was one of the beautiful outcomes. Uh, there's another group in uh, uh, Colombia, UMIAC. It's an organization that was created in 1999, and it includes five indigenous groups from, and from the rainforest and includes uh, spiritual authorities, medicine um, men and women, and their work is using uh, plant-based medicines to help find ways to preserve the Amazon forest, but also to promote the health of their communities and territories, including peace building by bringing together opposing sides um, of the civil war. And so, I mean, uh, we're not a part of this work, but we, we feel like it's, it's such good work and 
it's really worthwhile bringing attention to this so that we can think more broadly about the potential. Now, of course, everyone that I spoke to who was involved in this work noted that it is quite delicate for obvious reasons. And so it needs to be done very um, intentionally and, and consciously and um, in partnership with the individuals who um, the work is being done on behalf of. So as we uh, wrap up in a moment, uh, the, to summarize this quote I've held near and dear for many years, it keeps coming up for me as progress in this kind of work unfolds and as the field um, advances into this type of, of healing, and I'll just read it. It says, our work is to realize conscious harmony, first in oneself individually, then in one's group, then gradually pro projected, then gradually between groups, and so projected infinitely out into the world by Rodney Collin. So the best place to start is where you are now. We're not saying we have to drop it all and focus exclusively on solving world peace. Uh, we present this as an invitation to uh, reflect on the extent to which the work you do acts in a systemic way and consider increasing that focus by even just one degree because uh, as Adele mentioned, a little can go a long way and have ripple effects throughout uh, families and communities. So I'll play one final video to illustrate the potential for systemic healing. And we hope you can see that the healing can happen on so many levels, at the individual level, at the family level, the group level, beyond. And um, we're just so honored to be a part of this movement. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you.